Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neo Systems CMMC Town Hall. Now, I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neo Systems. Ed? Hi, and welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Uh, today, my guest is Amy Howland, and sketching our discussion is Angela Krieg. So, welcome to both of you. Um, we are, I want to mention to everyone that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Our focus at Neo Systems as a managed service provider is on organizations seeking certification under CMMC. So that's mostly who we have in the audience today. If you do have some questions, please put those in the Q&A feature within Zoom and I'll try to work those in as much as possible um, within the 30 minutes we have today. I'll, I'll start with introduction of our guest, Amy Howland. Amy was the CISO for Perspecta until just recently when that company was acquired by Periton. She has over 20 years experience in cybersecurity and information assurance, including work as a CISO for CSRA, now part of uh, General Dynamics Information Technologies. She also had cybersecurity leadership roles at Blue Canopy, Avaya Government Solutions, and Ernst & Young. She has a practical real world experience starting out performing ethical hacking and now running large scale security operations. Uh, Amy is uh, rejoining us. She joined this series a month ago in April, and on that call, she mentioned that she had recently undergone an audit by the DIBCAC, the Defense Industrial Based Cyber Security Assessment Center, and she offered to come back on and share her experience. So please welcome Amy back today for a deep dive into the DIBCAC assessment experience. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Amy. Thanks for having me back. Let's, um, let's start with a little background on the DIBCAC and the audits they're performing. So this organization was stood up um, by Defense Contract Management Agency, DCMA, in 2019 with the mission of evaluating contractor compliance with NIST uh, SP 800-171, mostly. Um, do you know, how did they choose Perspective for an audit? What's the, what's the background on how you got connected up with them? You know, it was interesting. We were expecting to be selected, uh, just having some large contracts in the defense and, you know, within uh, the DOD. We were actually selected through one of our, it was a very recent acquisition at the time. Um, and so we actually had to uh, talk to the DIBCAC because I think it was back in the fall of 2020. And uh, we were absorbing that acquisition uh, fully into Perspecta. And so we actually had them wait and, and do a Perspecta assessment instead of this uh, smaller company. So um, do you have any insight into how they choose which companies to pick? I mean, did, did you, you said you were expecting to be picked. So did, do they announce that? Or do they talk to, uh, talk to you ahead of time? Or was it just uh, that you just expected that that was going to be the case? Uh, just really being part of the defense industrial base and then having, you know, sort of being a, you know, a moderately large company and, and having uh, contracts in that space. Got it. So the, the assessment standard, so this 800-171A um, lays out three different assessment types. So basic, focused, comprehensive, and the new DFAR 7019 rule calls these basic, medium, and high. So basic is the self-assessment that we've all been asked to do under DFAR 7019. And the DIBCAC is out there doing the medium and high level assessments. Which, which level did you have at, at Perspective? We had a high assessment. And is, is that their choice, your choice? Is there is there logic behind that that you're aware of? So it's, I believe that's their choice. And I had actually looked into this. I don't know for sure, but the, the moderate or medium level assessment appears to be more of a review of your system security plan and the way that you are responding to how you're implementing the controls, whereas the high assessment is really more of um, uh, interview, demonstration, you know, review, um, really looking at it. And so I think the expectation that I had in, in going for a, a level three CMMC assessment is that it would probably want to do the more in-depth review, and that would be the high assessment. So the, the, the requirements they're looking at is, is 800, you know, NIST 800-171. These are not new requirements, right? They've been out for a few years. S still, in terms of readiness, having an outside auditor come in to look at that definitely raises the bar. So was this something that you had prepared for prior to getting the audit notice? Like, did you were you down the path of saying, hey, we, we're going to expect this kind of audit? We were, and a lot of what we were doing was for CMMC. And so as, as I was, you know, as you think about this, there's sort of the, the arrow that goes both ways between uh, DIBCAC and CMMC. So you have to be 
uh, you certainly have to be minimally ready for DIBCAC in order to have your foundation for CMMC. And if you're working on CMMC, then you should certainly very well be prepared for DIBCAC. So we were, I mean, you know, as, as all of us have had to be compliant with 171 for, for years and, and sort of from my perspective, we were an integrated company. And so there's always a lot of work to do when you, you're merging companies together and then getting you know, the SSP in place for that newly merged company and getting all the controls in place as a consolidated system. So for us at Perspective, it was a, a work in process as we kept you know, meeting additional milestones. So we were um, going down the path to make sure that we had our I's dotted and T's crossed for DIBCAC and it's kind of funny because the way it fell, we actually assumed we would have the CMMC assessment prior to DIBCAC. And if we all remember the, the dates have, and, and I think when I do this, it's probably the other way, but it's uh, the dates kept slipping to the right. Um, and so it, it, it was kind of funny how it went, worked out that we had DIBCAC first, but we actually had, um, we, we had some external um, assistance from some consultants. And then we also had an internal team. Uh, we have a performance excellence team who had actually, uh, who is a C, uh, I'm sorry, just a 3PAO. And so they had a lot of experience from a FedRAMP perspective. And so we worked internally with that group. So it's internal, but they're external to the CIO and the IT and the CISO organization. Um, and so we were working with them to prepare for readiness for CMMC, which, which wound up really you know, doing well for DIBCAC. So was there, I mean, given that you had all that preparatory work in place, um, was there any sort of last minute cram for the test that you felt was needed? And, and, and what did you do kind of immediately prior after you got the audit notice and before the, the team showed up? Sure. So there's a lot of last minute. I think it has to do with, you know, personalities and, and uh, where you are as, as a company. And again, whether you, you're sort of in a complacent state or if you have a lot of changes from integration. So I think um, for us, there was sort of those last minute final, like really, really looking through the SSP, making sure that um, you, we answered all of the questions or, or talked to all of the controls, but really also address those control objectives. A lot of people uh, forget about those and they just look at the top level NISP control, but there's actually anywhere from one to, I don't know, 10 um, control objectives that have to be met. And so we really went over our SSP with a fine tooth comb, make sure that, you know, maybe if we had put information in or updated it last year, that it was still accurate. We actually talked to um, our folks in IT operations and other areas that were really part of that control, so to speak, and had them evaluate. And we said, you know, is this, here's what we've written to address this. Is this correct? Is this what you're doing? And as we all know, you know, what you have in your SSP should be your process and the process that you talk to should be what's in your, your SSP. So we formed that out and, and really talked to, to folks and we made sure we sort of did the I's dotted, T's crossed. I'm saying that a lot, but it's not it. Um, to make sure that we had an artifact for every single control and that artifact was really addressing each control objective. And then again, there's sort of the other nuance where you really have to think through what is the control saying? And so this was sort of, you know, it, some of it was last minute if we realized we might have missed something along the way, but you have the controls can hit so many different areas. They might be, you know, you're answering the control, but are you answering it for workstations and servers and network devices? Because in companies fortunate enough to have you know, multiple teams to address those areas, it's different people different processes still getting to the same end state. So we had to make sure that we had an artifact or a show me ready for every one of those areas to address the control and the control objective. So audience question that came in is how, how difficult was it for your team to get those artifacts together and any sort of tips and tricks for people that you know maybe have not collected that previously? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it depends. Um, it's sort of by team. And, and I will say that I, I don't think it's certainly probably not just my opinion. The 171 controls are not uh, as clear as they could be. There's anywhere from what five to 10 words, you know, in, in the control. So what I would highly recommend and what we did was instead of just using um, the 171 A's, we used the CMMC level three assessment guide. 
uh, it's, it's excellent. Not only does it give you the control, it then gives you the detailed information, the technical information about that control, and then it provides a scenario. And the scenarios, I feel they're, they're more suited a bit towards smaller, uh, smaller businesses, but it still gives you a sense of the idea of what are they looking for? What is this control really talking about? And that was very helpful to us to dive into to sort of get with the artifacts. The other hard part was some controls are very simple to understand. You either do this, you have multi-factor authentication or you don't. Um, and I didn't mean to simplify that one particular control, but there's other controls uh, to be honest, I'll hopefully speak for many is what exactly is the saying? What, you know, what do they want? And coming from the compliance team and, you know, calling up our, our server lead and, and reading the control and saying, provide us a, an artifact for this does not work in 90% of the cases. You really need to understand um, from a cyber or a CISO team compliance perspective, what it is, what do you need and what do you want? And ask the question to your peers in English instead of just reciting the control. And that might seem obvious, but I don't think it's done very often. People will cut and paste the control or the control objective and send an email and say, provide this to me. And, and it's a bit of Greek. So I think really think through what is it that you're asking and how can you meet the control? So sort of translating that from NIST language to, you know, administrator, system administrator language, right? Right. The, you're right. You mentioned some of the controls not being so obvious. So I think one of the questions that I run into is how much is enough? You know, have So yes, we've sort of met this, but have we done everything that we're supposed to do, right? Have we completely met it? Is it everything that the auditor is going to expect when they get here is, is kind of a question that runs around. Yeah. And well, and that's why I think it's great to have and whether you can have, a, I guess, an internal external party, as I was mentioning, a, a group that was internal to the company, but external to my team, or if you're fortunate enough to have an actual external party to come in, because they're going to look at things a little differently. They're going to ask questions like the assessors would, and they might ask a question in a way that's different from what you've thought about before or how you've looked at the control that makes you think. And honestly, I think it's better to be overprepared and therefore more confident going into your assessment than just you know barely scraping by and, and not ready. So there's an audience question about, um, can you tell us how you did your risk matrix? And I guess the, that could be risk register, could be POEM, could be you know whatever you're gonna show the auditor from a risk perspective. Sure, um, I have to remember that. So we had gone in, without, um, we, we had our, our poem, our risk register for poems that had all been completed. So that was just sort of the standard format of, you know, what was out when, you know, uh, when we completed it and, you know, what we needed to complete. Um, there were several risk questions, if I remember, that were really more about the process. Um, so I'm trying to remember. So from a risk register, I think we showed um, examples or samples of risk assessments that we had performed that were either uh, a formal risk assessment, kind of like the 800-30, um, or we have uh, processes and procedures where we have a, a risk steering committee. And so we provided you know, the minutes for a sample of some of those meetings and, and some of the um, the risk acceptance requests that we had. So we also talked about how we had handled enterprise risk management in the company. So it was sort of providing a lot of information to address the various risk controls. So one more kind of preparatory question. Um, how was the issue of scope handled? Like, did, do you have all your systems in scope or have you segregated things that might be CMMCs that would have CUI and other systems that might not? Is, is that an issue based on how you structured your IT? Yeah, I think it it it's it can be an issue. We structured ours. We had a, and that was another thing that we really fine tuned and honed as we were, you know, getting ready, um, made our network diagram better. So we sort of overlaid um, the network diagram that we had at a high level network diagram that showed, you know, different perspective systems, data centers, you know, some of the cloud pieces, and we showed the whole picture, and then we had a boundary. Um, that was the corporate network boundary that excluded, you know, obviously a lot of the SaaS. I mean, we're, you know, not doing an assessment of our SaaS providers. It's what we use. Um, and we showed that they were there and important to us, but we had them outside of the boundary. We also then took sort of the CUI data flow 
diagram. I think we had a separate one, but we also took that network diagram and marked all of the areas like where we would have CUI in our organization, whether that was at the data centers and 0365 and, you know, on the workstations and the servers. Um, and so we sort of showed where all of those would be located and it was pretty easy to identify. So let's, let's dive into the actual audit um, experience itself. So describe the process, um, you know, the, the planning ahead of that, and, and then your interaction with the auditors when they were there. Sure. And I'm so glad, you know, you, you had me on to do this because I, and I hope it's really valuable. I know um, I had the benefit of, of talking to a few people who had gone through it ahead of me. Um, and, and I was happy to pay it forward as a, a few folks, you know, reached out to me and, I gave that information. I think and until you do it, because you know we're all ready to prepare for an audit or an assessment, but these are very few and far between. So what was it? So um, in getting ready, and it goes a little bit to your question before in regards to the prep, but, but um, the assessors, I will say, were absolutely fantastic. And and I know that's hard to say. You know, no one. I used to be a financial auditor in a prior life, and that, that's always uh, you know hard. Uh, relationship, but uh, they were very helpful. So there was a lot of prep in advance of, you know, just saying, here's the schedule. Uh, the assessors reached out. They're like, here's the collaboration tool. Here's how we're going to use it. Let's schedule a time to get you and your team and folks together to make sure that it works, that you guys are comfortable with it. Um, here's the control families. Here's how we're going to talk to them on different, you know, on each day. So what we did in advance is we had a matrix of our points of contact internally for the controls, but it was older and we fine tuned it so that we went through all 110 controls for DIBCAC. And we made sure that we had a point of contact, whether it was uh, the network lead, the server, shared services, uh, the SOC, um, you know, which team it was. And then also look to say, okay, so just because this is, you know, a network type control, we have our network director, is he really the one who's going to provide the show me or how do you do this? Or is it somebody else? And so we made sure that we had this lined up. Um, we scheduled time and this is very administrative and, and I know this is not the meat yet of the question, but I will tell you it is so important because I had a confident and prepared team going into this. And I, I'm you know, very, very proud of the comments and the compliments that we got from the DIBCAC assessors in regards to um, you know, the, uh, I probably should have written, I have them written down, that's how proud I was, but about the collaboration amongst our team. So we had all of these written down and we made sure that we reached out to everybody and said, uh, Ed, you're, you, you know, you're, we have you responsible for um, 3.1.2, A, do you agree? And then B, why don't we talk about it a little bit? Are you, you know, this is um, make sure that you're you're prepared to speak to this control, that you're able to show information. So we had all of that. We had all of our artifacts uh, organized in order and labeled by control. And, and actually, we have them labeled by CMMC and uh, NIST 171, since we're sort of versed in both worlds. Um, so we set up times on everyone's calendar and we blocked off the time. So the DIPCAC assessment is, is about a week. It's actually less. Um, the first day is an in-brief from the DIPCAC and it's also an in-brief from the company. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth here and go through the timeline and talk about, you know, how, um, how that came about. So as for prep, they provide a list of things that they'd like to see in advance. Um, th they're not always very specific, but it talks to, and you'll know what it is to provide to get there. So it might be um, your standards, your policies, your governance document, your network diagram. And so we got all of this ready and packaged up in advance of the assessment and sent it via a safe drop system that they have. I also prepared a PowerPoint because they said, here's the things we'd like to talk about. And so in those things, they had uh, a list and all of these items. And so what I did is I made sure it tied out as per an audit and went through and had a discussion. So that was the in brief and all of that was provided. What they then do is they use that first day as they being the assessors as a reading day. And so they take all the documentation that you provided, they look through it. <clears throat> And um, then the next two or three days is really interviews 
and show me's and discussions. And there were some of my colleagues at other companies who had multiple virtual rooms at the same time. So they might have, you know, three um, virtual calls at from, you know, nine to 12. We were actually steered to do it all together, which we were surprised um, at, but it wound up working quite flawlessly because you had everybody together and the assessors were able to get information from other assessors in the question. So if there's an IA control that's related to an AU control or something, and we show and talk about it on Tuesday, but that other control family is not till Wednesday, that assessor is listening and watching and they're able to check off certain controls or certain items so that you don't have to go through it again. Um, so, so we did that and um, there's a lot of discussion and show me and uh, sharing screens and turning a screen over to Ed, who will maybe then show, you know, will log into a device and show configuration. Um, and it was uh, quite, quite flawless in that we had everybody ready, either already on the call or on standby to log in at a moment's notice if they were needed. So you, you mentioned my name a couple of times. Are, are you trying to give me action items or do you have another left-handed security guy named <laughs> can't tell. <laughs> I'm using your wrong person. I can use my best friend, Joe Smith, if you want. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to be, to be the, the John Doe of this conversation. So um, question from the audience, were, were they focused on all CUI or just D DOD CUI? Or I guess maybe I'll, I'll rephrase a little bit. Were they really looking at the data or were they taking that for granted that you had defined this, the scope already? That is another great question. And so it's sort of, if you think about the scope, not every single system and every single server has CUI on it, but we had taken the approach that, you know, these are the general types of places that it is. So I think when there's certain controls that were very specific that literally use the word CUI in it, uh, that might have been a focus. But I would say, let me think about this. I would say that it was taken for granted that we provided the scope of where CUI was for the most part. And it was, you know, here's all of our configurations and all of our systems that are protecting that data. Got it. Um, so as, as far as the outcome of what you got from this, is that it's a scorecard? Um, I assume they're using that scoring methodology that we've been using under the DFARS for the mm -hmm. Spurs score with, you know, negative scores and up to a perfect 110. It, it, was there any notion of a passing grade and do they give you anything other than a score like what's the outcome that you get from this sure so every day and uh, let me go back a little bit to talk through so when i was talking about the interviews and those like a nine to twelve one to three every day the tuesday wednesday they went and they being the assessors went and did had their own internal meeting uh, to discuss how the day went and I had chosen to have my team leads have an internal meeting as well to say, hey, how do we think the day went? Let's be ready to you know, kind of talk about it. We then had a hot wash is what they called it with the assessors in the late afternoon. And they went through everything from the day and they would flash up the, um, the sheet of all the controls and you'd see all the greens or you know, where they you know, check things off. And if there was anything to discuss or any questions, they made you aware of it that moment that day. So by 3.30 or four o'clock each day, you knew if there were any issues from that whole uh, day earlier. Um, and so the debrief at the end, so every, you know, was no surprise. It was really everything we were aware of every day. And the score was provided. They talk about how the score you know, would be calculated. And um, I, I trying to remember, I feel like there had been some discussions where it's not, there's not really, you know, a passing grade. They, they did explain how it can be, as you said, very negative. Um, but they provide that if there's any findings, they will talk to, you know, what the, the finding is. Um, and that's really it. They don't tell you how to do anything, how to fix anything, just if they had any findings. Um, and then they provide a formal report, which they have up to 60 days to do, we had received ours um, probably a month and a half. So well before that, probably 45 days or less. 
And again, it's nothing different, no surprises. It's, you know, it's so the, the outbreak is more formal than the daily, you know, here's your, here's how you're doing. And um, the formalized report is just that it's sort of more formal. And then they update your score in, scur in SPURS, which is, you know, from the, the DIBCAC score, not the basic assessment. And also each day they um, t give you readiness items that they'll want for like the next day or so as the different assessors um, are, are gonna have the different control families. So there's homework at night that you're gonna wanna do. And in order to upload and have everything organized and, and to be very honest, administrative again, because you're gonna wanna change your file name to have the, the uh, naming convention that they're asking about or that they're calling it and making sure that you're very clearly identifying you know, they're asking you for something. You want them to be very clear that you asked me for this. I am providing it to you. So you might be changing file names around before uploading them as well. Um, got one other audience question about how many assessors were involved. And I'll tag onto that and say, how big was the team on your side? So in total, how many people were you know involved in this over the course of the week? Oh, wow. That's a great question. So the assessors, um, there is probably a lead assessor and maybe one assessor for that had maybe two or three control families. So maybe four or five, six different assessors. And then we also had a, um, and it was virtual, but we also did have a physical uh, person come on site that was assessing physical security. So it was a hybrid and the person came on site for one day for a couple hours, met with some of our uh, CSO staff and physical security staff, did some walking around. And also that afternoon, one of um, my team members met him and escorted the DIPCAC assessor to our data center and did a quick tour of the data center. So there is a physical element. From my team, um, if you bear with me, I, I have no idea on numbers but it was a lot of my team leads. Um, if you think about security operations, uh, SOC and compliance, as well as a few other staff. And then we would have largely at least the leads for network server workstation um, on at all times. And then there was a lot of other folks because it's usually the system administrators that are the ones doing the show me's. So sort of a, a hodgepodge. And then we actually had a lot of, if you think about it from a calendar perspective, we had a lot of, um, of uh, tentative calendar invites, like you please, you know, don't join the call necessarily, but be ready. Um, and those were even from folks outside of the CIO organization who might've been able to talk about, you know, internal audit or other, you know, physical security or other areas. So sort of, um, um, a, a, a lot of people. Sounds like, I mean, it sounds very, very involved. Um, so I have so many questions, so little time. I, I'll, I'll warn uh, maybe you and the audience, we're going to probably run over a couple of minutes here because uh, yeah. I, I want to get some tie in back to CMC. Um, how, how valuable was this experience to you as a CISO in determining priorities? You were already on a CMC path, as you mentioned. So the fact that this audit team came in and took you through these in-depth checks, what was the benefit to you of, as a CISO in setting your priorities? So many. I think it's a great question because, you know, if, if everybody has the luxury of lots and lots of time and everyone's ready well in advance and you have everything perfect, great, good for you. And that's fantastic. But again, with so many of us in the div who are integrated companies who just have all this stuff going on, it's not that simple. And what this does is it, give you, it gives you a deadline whether it was for CMMC first or DIBCAC first, and you have to have your stuff ready regardless. And, and most people are doing the right thing. It's just a matter of, do you have a screenshot or an artifact you know, for everything that's already documented? Do you have all your paperwork in place? So I think what it does is because we were getting ready and we had to stop and make sure that we were as close to perfect as we could be on our controls that, you know, and our documentation was right, that helped us get more ready for CMMC because of all the process documentation and the maturity documentation, and it helped us go through it. So from a CISO perspective, knowing how hard everybody worked to do all of these projects 
and then getting validation from an external party, the DIPCAC assessor, that we were square right on was really fantastic because we're like, well, we think this is what it is. But here's the part that I think you wanna be aware of. The DIPCAC assessment is one week or less. And I will stress the less. The CMMC assessment for a larger company level three is probably about four to six weeks, not taking into account reciprocity, meaning, hey, here's your DIPCAC stuff. How much time that shaves off, we're not sure yet. A week or two, I don't know. But think about, you know, we have half an hour. How many questions can you ask me, Ed, in four weeks versus how many questions can you ask me in four days? And if you think about it, that's where the difference is with CMMC. That's where they're going to be really diving into your processes and how do you do this? And there were things they did not ask us um, that we were a little surprised about getting into detailed levels on you know, different types of scans and remediations. And um, it just, there wasn't time to get into that level of detail where we know that CMMC is going to be asking that. So if you have your foundation set with 171 and readiness for a DIPCAC assessment, that's fantastic. You then need your 20 additional controls the exact same way you did it for DIPCAC. And then all the process documentation, the resource, plan, the maturity, the process documents, I'd said that already, but there's a lot. And, you know, just sort of that level of the fact that you've been been doing this. That's key, right? This this uh, assessment you just described, pretty rigorous, but doesn't include any check of your maturity in the same way that um, that that CMMC does. Right. Um, all right. Let me ask on one kind of wrap up question. So another big difference between the DIBCAC audits and the CMMC audits is that, you know, the CMMC is done with a company that you chose at a time of your choosing where the DIBCAC is, is brought in by the DOD when they decide. So as, as we're preparing for our CMMC audits, we all have to be ready for the possibility of DIBCAC audit. Like we won't all get one. It's kind of like the IRS audits, right? Not everybody will get one, but you always have to expect it. It might happen. Um, so perhaps, you know, it might happen before we feel like we're quite ready. What's your advice in terms of actions people should take now that are already on the CMMC path, which I think all of our audience is, what are the actions they should take now to be ready for DIPCAC should they get an audit notice you know, while they're on the journey? Be honest with yourself. Really look at your SPUR score. Um, I certainly hope folks, you know, I didn't put in 110 because it was easy to do so. And if you put in 110, know in your absolute heart that you really feel you've done it. Because if you really do not think that you can prove 110 controls and talk to how those are there, you are not going to be able to do so in a, in a DIBCAC assessment and you are not going to be ready for CMMC. And I think that's also going to do some disservice if you're putting 110 and the assessor comes in and I, I don't even know what score to throw out there, but if it's significantly less, if there's a finding or two findings, that's, that's fine because it's a matter of how they're looking at it or how you looked at it or what risks you were looking to accept that maybe, you know, they weren't, but I think it's really about being honest and assessing it, going through it yourself, like you're an auditor and making sure that you have that ready to go. And again, the 110, it's what, like 85% of, you know, 80% of the 130 controls. I think there is a tendency for, to overinflate that spur score it, 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 because there's two audiences there. One is the DOD where you can provide your date and compliance date, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the other is, you know, prime contractors are out there asking, hey, tell us, tell us that you're compliant. You've been self-attesting for four years now. So the expectation is, you know, you've been already been saying you have it. So to come in with a very low score at this stage gives people, I think, pause. So there's, there's a, there's a tendency. So I, I think that's good advice to be honest about, you know, what do you have in place and what could you actually demonstrate to an outside, outside party? That's good. Right. And, and I know we're out we're real short on time here, but the, the idea is, you know, you are allowed to have POAMs in a DIPCAC assessment, whereas you can't for CMMC. So if you have those POAMs, you know, really be prepared for how, are, when are you going to finish those and have that plan in place? Because, you know, if you have to have your 17 controls in place for, for all of us in the DIP for CMMC level one. Um, and if you're going for, you know, level three, there's, there's obviously a big delta there. Well, Amy, this is really good information. I think it's it's for many of us, that's the first glimpse at what a real cybersecurity audit looks like. I mean, some people um, in the CMMC world and the defense industrial base have gone through other audits, uh, SOC audits or FedRAMP or something similar. 
but for many, many in the DIB, this will, you know, their first experience will be either their CMMC audit or the, or maybe a DIBCAC audit mm -hmm. ahead of that. So I think this is very valuable, very practical advice. So thanks very much for, for joining us. And thank you to the audience for the great questions and for your attention today. Uh, please do join us for future town hall meetings. Our next session, we're going to have as a guest, Eric Crucius of Holland and Knight. We're going to talk about the new executive order that the Biden administration released on cybersecurity and, and pull that apart a little bit and look at how it relates to what we're all doing under CMMC. That's going to be Wednesday, May 26th at one o'clock Eastern, our usual time. Uh, we will take a, a break the following week because of the Memorial Day holiday. So we'll skip a week and start back up in, in June. If you need some details on that, please visit our website, neosystemscorp.com for the details. Thanks, everyone.